Welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Church of Prescott Valley, Arizona, on this Transfiguration of Christ Sunday. It's the last Sunday before we begin the season of Lent. Now might be a good time to stop or pause the video to go to our website at emmanuellutheranpv.org to download our order of worship so that you can follow along with all the words and the responses. Let us begin, for we gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We share our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. Dear friends, how vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we're called to be the beloved community living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. Please join us in singing our opening hymn, Alleluia, God of Gladness.
Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintops into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. And now it's time for the children's time to shine. So today in our gospel lesson, we learn about something called Jesus's transfiguration. That means Jesus was transformed. In the story, we hear about Jesus suddenly becoming shining white and bright and wearing white clothes in front of three of the disciples. He changed. But what's more important is that Jesus encourages us to change. Today I have with me Tim's cactus. I noticed it, we've had it for a while, maybe uh, four months or so, and it's just sad and looked pretty much the same. But last week in the evening when I came to close the lights and turn off the lights and the blinds, I found out that it was blooming. If you look, you can see the little blooms on it. Isn't that amazing? From just being a prickly plant to a beautiful blooming plant with these lovely bright pink flowers. Isn't that great? We can be transformed like that when we remember how much God loves us, that we're called God's beloved children. And so we can remember that even when we feel prickly, that we can bloom with bright flowers just like this cactus did when we are transformed by the love of God and Jesus. So let us pray. Dear Lord, help us to always remember how much you love us so that we too can reflect your light and shine. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's kids say, Amen. Our first reading comes to us from 2 Kings, the second chapter. Today's reading centers on the transfer of power and authority from the prophet Elijah to Elisha. Their travels, which retrace the path of Joshua back to Moab, the place where Moses died, and the parting of the waters, demonstrates that Elisha and Elijah are legitimate successors of the great prophet Moses. Beginning with the first verse. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were there in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jer Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. Then when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you, for I am before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. 
But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. reading comes to us from Mark, the ninth chapter, beginning with the second verse. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who was talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Dear Mother, Father, Creator of the earth, be present as we proclaim your word and open our ears and hearts that we might learn more about you and your will for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So last week, we were in that first chapter of Mark, hearing how Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. But because Lent starts this Wednesday, we have jumped past much of the teaching of Jesus and have come to the point where the shift happens from Jesus' active ministry among the disciples to when he begins facing Jerusalem the place of his death and resurrection. Mark mentions that this event takes place six days after something. Why tell us about six days? In the Bible, numbers are very important, often symbolic. This may be to show a connection to Moses in the Exodus lesson where Moses waited six days for God to speak. Later in the text, there's an even stronger connection made to Moses. Notice that the transfiguration event took place, as many biblical events do, on a mountaintop high. Moses spent 40 days and nights on the mountaintop waiting for those Ten Commandments. Elijah, in 1 Kings chapter 19, was sent by the word of the Lord to a mountaintop to find that the Lord was not in the wind, the earthquake, or the fire there. And now Jesus was sharing this mountaintop experience with Peter, James, and John, and they'll see Moses and Elijah. There is a strong emphasis on the Moses connection in this story. Moses represents the law and Elijah, the prophets, but in the end, they leave and Jesus will remain. 
to return to the valley where death awaits him. When the disciples get to the top of the mountain, Jesus, their friend and teacher, changes right in front of their eyes. His face shines like the sun and his clothes become dazzling white. Another connection to Moses. Then suddenly, Jesus is speaking to Moses and Elijah. My first question is, how do the disciples know that it's Moses and Elijah? Were there pictures of them hanging in the synagogue? Or did they have name tags? Or maybe a monogram on their pocket? One of my pastor friends speculated that maybe they had their names across the back of their robes, like uh, football or baseball players. <laughs> However it happened, the disciples knew who they were. And Peter immediately offers to build a booth or a, a place of shelter for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Maybe Peter wants to try to save this hallmark moment by building a place to put it in, to try and somehow prolong this shining moment, because he doesn't want to face what awaits them down in the valley. For whatever reason, here is Peter trying to do something, to get busy. <laughs> He's unable to dwell in the moment, to be truly in awe of Jesus, to let the power of God break over him. I know that I'm often guilty of this. Yes, I'm off rushing to get my cell phone to take that picture of that fabulous sunset rather than just stand in awe of the moment. I'm busy trying to save it for prosperity by taking a picture of it instead of dwelling in that moment. It's easier to try to do something than to ponder and embrace the holiness of God. That can be overwhelming. Most of us can identify with Peter's need to get busy. But an amazing thing happens. A voice from heaven stops him in his tracks. It's God. And what does God say? God tells the disciples that Jesus is God's beloved son and that they should listen to him. We've heard most of these words before. In fact, just last month, they're the same words that God spoke to John the Baptist at the River Jordan on the day that Jesus was baptized. The disciples were not at the baptism. The disciples knew Jesus as a friend and a teacher they had seen him do miracles. They had some idea that he was special. Peter had recently said that Jesus was the son of the living God. But this is God telling them exactly who Jesus was and what they should do about it. They should listen. Listen to what he has been saying all along that the end of Jesus' ministry on earth is coming and life will never be the same again. But by that same token, death will never be the same again either. Today is Valentine's Day. I kind of think of this as being the very first Valentine ever received. God calling Jesus God's son, beloved. In our baptism liturgy, we call Jesus God's beloved Son as we remember Christ's own baptism. We claim our baptism because by his own death and resurrection, Jesus freed us from the bonds of sin and death. So we can be called the children of God and be marked with the cross of Christ forever. Jesus and the disciples are on the mountain. Peter was all ready to scrounge around and find some building materials and memorialize this moment, but he's interrupted by God telling him who Jesus was. Needless to say, the disciples react to this incredible pronouncement as any of us would. Does this glorious vision increase their faith in Jesus? No. The text tells us they're terrified. The same fear that kept Peter from accepting that soon Jesus would suffer and die also kept Peter from hearing the words about the resurrection, that in three days after his death, Jesus would return to life. What does Jesus then do for these stupefied disciples? After all, they don't even realize that they're alone with Jesus again. 
Moses, Elijah, and God have removed themselves from the scene. In other texts, when Jesus heals people, he tells them to return to their lives and to tell no one. Although it doesn't say it, I can assume that Jesus is no longer shining and white. He's again their friend and teacher and healer who speaks calming words to them, encouraging them not to be afraid. We are all in need of these divine words. They're healing life-giving and transforming. We are not divine and holy like Jesus, but we can offer these same comforting words of Jesus to each other. We can reach out to each other and say, don't be afraid, I'm here with you. The story of the transfiguration does not change Jesus. He's already human and divine. The transfiguration changed the disciples. They came down from that mountain different than when they went up. They were beginning to understand who Jesus really was. The season of Epiphany begins and ends with that heavenly voice making Jesus known to the world. In our baptism, we have declared ourselves members of the body of Christ and workers in the kingdom of God. We too are called to be transformed to take the word of God in the human presence of Jesus to fearful people, to offer the words of new life, to help others stand tall in their faith. On this Transfiguration Sunday, we may not shine like Jesus, but we can change how we think about Jesus, his mission and our mission in the world. As Luther would say, we're called to be little Christs to each other to be God's presence in the world. As we prepare ourselves for the weeks of Lent ahead, may we take time to stop being busy like Peter and listen to what Jesus is saying. I invite you to consider joining us in reading our Lenten devotional book, A Story to Tell, that's available uh, at, uh, in the plastic bin outside the front door of the church. You can come and pick it up at any time and spend some time these next 40 days in prayer and meditation as part of your Lenten discipline. This is an opportunity to be still and listen to what God has to say to us. So friends, may we listen and be transformed by the words of Jesus and by his healing touch in our lives. Amen. Please join me in singing our hymn of the day beautiful Savior.
join me in our prayers of intercession. Guided by Christ made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the gospel proclaimed in word and deed, for communities of faith far and near, online and in person, and for all who show the face of Christ throughout the world, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For creation, sun, moon, and stars, life forming in the dark earth and ocean deep, mountains, clouds, and storms, and creatures seen and unseen, and for the Holy Spirit's guidance in our stewardship of God's creation, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those responsible for safety and protection, for emergency responders and security guards, for healthcare workers and aides, attorneys and advocates, civil servants and leaders of government, that they witness to mercy and justice throughout the world. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For all who suffer this day, especially those affected by the global pandemic, that Christ our healer transforms sickness into health, loneliness into companionship, bereavement into consolation, and suffering into peace. Let us pray, have mercy, O God. For companions on life's journey in this worshiping community, for loved ones who can't be with us this day, and for guidance during struggles we face, that God's glory is revealed around and among us, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Please take this time to offer any other prayers you may have now, either silently or aloud. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed who now rest from their earthly pilgrimage, that their lives of service and prayer inspire us in our living. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Gathered together as God's people, we share the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we give thanks for the offerings that we've received in the mail, online, and in person this past week. These gifts make it possible for us to continue to be the church in the world, even when we can't meet in our sanctuary. If you're worshiping with us today and would like to make a donation, please go to our website's homepage and click on the online giving link. And so let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you've blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions and your Son, Jesus. Use us and what we have gathered to show the world your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And so I offer this benediction. May God the Creator strengthen you, Jesus the Beloved fill you, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter keep you in peace. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, Love Divine, All Love Excelling.
Day, friends. Go in peace, be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. How a wonderful week, everyone. Thank you.